Hello and welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed your break. So we are coming now to our first panel, which will discuss discrimination against LGBTI persons and political backsliding. But before that, I was just wanted to make a, a short note on the questions. So thank you all for sending us your questions. And it's great that we receive all of your questions and we make sure that everything is read. But I have to say something. So. Uh, we can we ask for your understanding that um, we cannot answer questions that regard current uh, governmental decisions that in within this legislation hasn't been taken or might still be taken so um, we kindly ask you to to focus your question on the panels and on the question on the people there but uh, i make sure that all your questions will be read and will be sent to responsible units and um, so for example the questions regarding the National Action Plan on LGBTI rights or the, um, the questions regarding legal gender recognition on a, a new trans, uh, trans law. So um, these questions will be sent to the different units and um, so please if you have also specific questions you can send them to the ministry but okay so thank you for your understanding for this. And uh, now I'm very happy to uh, introduce you Mason Davis, who will moderate the next panel. Hello, Mason. Mason Davis is the Interim Executive Director of Transgender Europe. He was Interim Executive Director for the Global Trans and Intersex Organization, GATE, and he co-founded the International Trans Fund. And during many years, he was the executive director of the Transgender Law Cent Center in San Francisco. So welcome, Mason, and I'm handing over to you. Thank you so much, and thank you for everybody who put work into making today happen. Um, we are um, pleased to share uh, this first panel on discrimination against LGBTI persons and political black backsliding. Um, and honored to be joined by um, some very important and, and well-known experts in this area uh, to talk together today. Um, I'm, I'm do a quick introduction of everybody and then we'll turn it over to um, Katrin from ELGA Europe who's going to start with an intervention um, and to help ground us in today. Um, but before Katrin begins, um, really would like to just do a quick round uh, to introduce those who will be on the panel today. Uh, Jaron uh, Schackenbrook, the Director of Anti-Discrimination, Directorate General of Democracy from the Council of Europe. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Terry Rinke, I believe Terry's here, um, the MEP and co-president of the LGBTI in our group at the European Parliament. Uh, Michael Farrell, uh, Vice Chair of the European Commission Against Racism and Tolerance and member of the ECRI LGBTI Task Force. Um, Bea Sandor, project coordinator and legal expert from Hatter Society in Hungary. And then Katrin Hugelm-Dubel, who is our advocacy director at ELGA Europe, doing amazing things for the broader LGBT community. And we're going to start with Katrin um, to, to set some context and backgrounds to help understand what we're dealing with when we think about uh, discrimination in the region and the political backsliding today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Katrin. Yeah, thank you very much, Mason, for the introduction. And first of all, a big thanks to the German Presidency of the Council of Europe for organizing this conference and for inviting civil society and for inviting ILGA Europe to bring expertise and evidence um, to this debate. I was asked to speak about the current situation and backsliding. And just to be clear from the start, I think at the time when we see the erosion of human rights of LGBTI people, along with the rise of an anti-LGBTI hate rhetoric in countries across Europe, um, when we see that this is putting European democracy at risk and eroding core principles that the Council of Europe stands for, namely human rights, equality, freedom and human dignity, the framing of backsliding is unfortunately valid and I think it's, it's real. Um, but I want to make the point in my intervention that backsliding is not only about the rollback from some, but actually everyone's playing a part and thus it actually means everyone has an opportunity to get active and turn the tide together. And, and I just want to set that out in the following minutes. 
I think we can identify four elements in describing the current situation. They're all interlinked and they're creating a worrying mix um, of political and social context at the moment. And these four elements are, we see a rise in LGBTI phobic hate online, as well as in the streets, organized as well as individual. We see an anti-LGBTI hate speech and actions from political leaders and certain governments in our region. Um, it's the fact that across Europe, legislative processes on protecting LGBTI rights have stalled in all countries. And finally, it's the impact the pandemic is having in further worsening the situation. The rise in, in hate has been clearly documented by ILGA Europe, but also by um, our member organizations and by institutions taking place in this conference today. In February this year, ILGA Europe published its annual review and in reports from country after country, we see a stark rise in abuse, violence and hate speech against LGBTI people, both from official sources in the media, online and in the streets. And just yesterday, Minister Giffey, in her opening words, um, pointed to that as well. The German Ministry for the Interior published figures that show a 36% increase of LGBTI phobic hate and violence compared to 2019 in Germany. And we have similar figures from other countries. So sorry, I just pointed that out because it was really just published yesterday. At the same time, and that's my second point, we're seeing a resurgent, resurgence of authorities and officials using LGBTI people as scapegoats, while authoritarian regimes are empowered to isolate and legislate without due process due to the pandemic. So there's the infamous example of the presidential election campaign for the Polish president um, with statements that LGBTI people, LGBTI are not people, but an ideology that, that's worse than communism. Um, we've seen the Turkish government beginning of this year, yet again, stepping up its systematic attacks and defamation of LGBTI people, including blaming the community for the Turkish withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention. We've received reports from, um, of religious leaders blaming LGBTI communities for the pandemic from countries such as Georgia, Italy, Montenegro, Poland, Russia, Turkey and the Ukraine. We've seen attempts in several countries um, to define family as a heterosexual couple and their families in the constitutions. Um, we're yet again facing referenda against marriage equality. Um, protests being forbidden and LGBTI human rights defenders being detained in often very serious and worrying conditions. And we've seen hum Hungary abandoning any possibility for legal gender recognition just last year. And that leads me to my next point, and that stagnation we see on legislation and policy processes regarding the protection and LGBTI rights. After a momentum for reforms of legal gender recognition legislation, rec recognizing increasingly the right to self-determination of trans people in recent years, we today see legal regression and stagnation in 19 countries across Europe. Long made commitments on reforming legal gender recognition legislation are not followed through, including in countries like Finland, Germany, Cyprus and the UK. And in the meantime, what we see is that the implementation of existing procedures has worsened clearly, including in countries like Georgia, Spain, Azerbaijan, Serbia, Turkey and Northern Ireland. And the picture is not better in other areas of LGBTI rights protection. Just to pick one example, no legal advancement whatsoever on the, on the protection of LGBTI rights has been made in Latvia for over three years now. And that's not because Latvia has such a complete framework of the protection of LGBTI rights. I can't give away too much here because um, ILGA Europe is launching its next rainbow map on the 17th of May, but just a little teaser, you can check out exactly what the situation is in Latvia and other countries um, then on our map. My fourth point is finally the pandemic is having a real impact not only on LGBTI people, but also on the work of human rights defenders and LGBTI organizations, and especially their ability to engage in policy processes and with policymakers and institutions. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the LGBTI community has been documented by ILGA Europe as well as by institutions. 
including a rise in domestic violence, an increase in LGBTI homelessness, restrictions on freedom of movement and travel because family status are not being recognized, and far-reaching effect for trans, intersex and HIV positive people due to impact on healthcare systems, just to name a few. But also as a result of COVID-19 measures and redirection of government attention, LGBTI organizations find it much harder to engage with policymakers for the purpose of advocacy. Many LGBTI organizations had to shift their focus from advocacy to direct service provision and humanitarian aid in Europe for the community to address pressing needs and gaps in public service provision. Advocacy spaces and opportunities narrowed as institutions closed or ceased certain activities, planned events, institutional consultation, conference spaces were cancelled instead of moved online, public actions were impossible to hold, organizations did not have the resources to move their advocacy work online. In some countries, policymakers told LGBTI organizations that LGBTI rights were not a priority in the context of the pandemic. I think it's no exaggeration to say that Europe is at a crossroad. Certain groups and organizations are overtly turning the tide on LGBTI and other minority rights, seeking to replace democracy and diversity with what they call traditional values. The term traditional values is used to justify discrimination and human rights violations, not only against LGBTI people, but also against women and the achievement of women's rights movement over the last 50 years, as well as against other minorities. And we now increasingly see these forces trying to split movements as well, arguing that LGBTI rights and specifically trans rights go against women's rights. We all need to stand strong against such divisions um, when we see them. Because complacency, thinking we're on the right track and things will only get better, has played into that backsliding as well. And the current situation under the pandemic risks further worsening the situation for the reasons set out before. It's time to act on so many levels. It's more than ever important to reconfirm and strengthen commitments to LGBTI equality and use all instruments available for European institutions and national governments to take clear action on commitments made, advance important legislation, put in place policies and trainings that will ensure existing legislation is fully implemented, accessible and effective. Every country has steps to do and can lead by example and thus help to turn the tide. The recommendation and the review process play an important role in this sense as they provide a systematic and regular evaluation of the situation regarding the protection of LGBTI rights in all Council of Europe member states. Support and resources need to be reconfirm LGBTI equality. In the Council of Europe context, this includes support for the technical assistance in the implementation of the recommendation through the SOGI unit, support for the monitoring role of ECRI, support for the important role of the U European Court of Human Rights for strategic litigation and advancing legal protection and eliminating discriminatory practices. And of course, the new institutional body, the Steering Committee on Anti-Discrimination, Diversity and Inclusion. It's really the time to do more and not less. We need to continue to see both the European Union institutions and the bodies of the Council of Europe to fully hold their member states accountable by speaking out against homophobic, transphobic and intersex phobia and legal and other actions violating the fundamental rights of LGBTI people. And by using all the tools, infringement procedures, accountability regarding funding, implementation monitoring to hold all member states accountable. And we need to see all member states step up and relaunch with clear political commitment their processes, be they legal or political, for LGBTI rights. This is everyone's homework in turning the tide. And I think this is how we can really together work against the backsliding we're seeing by creating that wave that actually goes against the negative wave we're seeing. And I hope um, I could give some food for thought what everyone can do, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Katrine. Uh, really helpful background to help us 
really think about what we're dealing with today as we think about uh, LGBT rights throughout the region and, and what we're up against in this moment. I, I'd like to ask each of the other panelists to take just two or three minutes to respond and to, to share you know, what are your perceptions about what is going on? Why do you think we're seeing backsliding on LGBTI rights in Europe today? And what's needed to counter that trend? Uh, Bea, could we start with you? Yes, thank you. I think that uh, living and working in Hungary, uh, it's really, there's there's a lot to talk about when we talk about backsliding. Just on a very personal note, uh, I have uh, the happy memory of uh, being delegated in 2009 by the then government, not the present one, into the working group drafting the recommendations. So um, um, that's, that's, uh, that's something that happened in 2009 and could not have happened ever since. The present government would not ever think that they need uh, an expert's voice on LGBTQI equality. Um, LGBTI people and organizations seem to be especially vulnerable when political actors decide to mobilize their constituency by the polarization of societies using uh, what they call traditionalist na narratives to create enemies. Um, gender ideology narratives have, have really proven successful at mobilizing uh, constituencies of, of extremist uh, parties and other political formations in various countries of the world, uh, including Hungary. Uh, the so-called gender ideology narratives, that is anti-LGBTI and anti-women's rights narratives, uh, strengthened by governmental uh, communication and action, have gained momentum in Hungary since 2018, especially, and it's been going on ever since. It's revealed in banning gender studies programs in all over the state, uh, the withdrawal from ratifying the Istanbul Convention using the argument that, that, that uh, the problem with, with the convention is that it uses the word gender, the ban on legal gender recognition last year, and now recently the quasi ban on adoption by same sex partners and also changes to the fundamental law, the constitution of the country to discourage school staff to even mention the existence of, of LGBTI uh, people. It's, uh, it's revealed in a constant fear mongering against the powerful, the so-called powerful gender lobby, uh, in intolerant uh, uh, speech by state and government actors, which lead to a definite rising of hate speech acts all over the media and the social media. And uh, even authorities finding publications depicting same-sex couples or LGBTI people uh, on the ground that they endanger the, the moral development of, of children. So it's uh, there are backslides, there are definite uh, step backs we can see in certain countries, including Hungary. And what we need, I think, is that we do not succumb to fear mongering and keep on talking about equality, the equality of LGBTI people, to show um, people and advocacy efforts uh, to cooperate both locally and inter internationally, and to communicate, to, to raise social support for both civil society organizations working on uh, working for LGBTI equality and and to communicate and, and raise uh, social support of, of people who are who are not ideologies. Thank you so much. We have a lot to learn, I think, from Hungary and what you have learned there. So thank you for being a part of this. I'm um, wondering, Mr. Schokenbrook, can you share uh, as well your thoughts about why we're seeing backsliding on our rights in this moment and what's needed? Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for your question, uh, uh, Mason. First of all, thank you also very much to the German presidency for putting this together on this occasion uh, to discuss all these very crucial issues for Europe. Um, on the question of backsliding, um, I, th I think we, we know there has always been opposition to LGBTI rights. Um, 
Uh, the current situation is that the backsliding is, as was said also, by, they are linked to anti-gender move, anti movements that have gathered strength across Europe and beyond. Uh, but I think it's also important to put this in an even broader perspective. Um, you know, the Council of Europe has been set up to defend and promote and protect democracy, the rule of law and human rights. And we see a broader backsliding uh, tendencies in all those three key areas. Um, erosion of the rule of law, uh, we see uh, 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 democratic values and democratic practices also being eroded with mentalities like the winner takes all and ra rather than constructing societies in a pluralistic um, manner and last but not least in human rights in, in, in general. And what we are discussing today is, is one part of that bigger picture, I, I believe. Um, now, in the context uh, of this increased skepticism also of internationalism, of multilateralism, of international human rights law, all this is being contested more and more. It is more important, I think, than ever before to reaffirm and to strengthen the political commitment to our standards. Uh, and that is in this area, first and foremost, the 2010 recommendation um, and its implementation. Um, what also needs to be done is to put this again in a slightly broader context um, this is also about uh, strengthening societies and Europe's defenses against attacks uh, uh, um, anti discrimination uh, defenses needs to be strengthened. Our work for inclusion, our work against division. There are attempts to divide our societies and we must stand up very firmly uh, uh, against, against that. Um, now, this all these trends have not gone unnoticed. The Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe has adopted some important decisions in Helsinki two years ago, and notably the, the, what has been referred to by several speakers, the setting up of a new steering committee on anti-discrimination, uh, diversity and inclusion, CDADI, with precisely a broad mandate to combat discrimination and to fight for uh, protect diversity and fight for uh, inclusion. This includes, very importantly, SOCHI, LGBTI uh, equality issues. Um, and I think reference was made also to already by Katrin to the COVID uh, impact of the COVID pandemic. I think it is very, in a way, symbolic today that today, as we celebrate the 72nd anniversary of the Council of Europe, um, the Committee of Ministers adopted only four hours ago the, uh, the guidelines uh, on how uh, to uphold equality and combat discrimination and hate during the COVID-19 crisis um, and similar crises in the future. And this uh, important, uh, important um, guidelines include all the issues that we have uh, learned about, that uh, difficulties that LGBTI communities, individuals have faced, and the homophobic hatred and, and other forms of hatred that we have witnessed. They are mainstreamed in this important Committee of Ministers text. So that is, there are important steps already being taken. We need to support them. We need to even further strengthen the bulwark against further erosion uh, and, and further decline of these values. Um, now here, human, uh, LGBTI persons, human rights are not special rights, of course. It is very important uh, uh, to keep strengthening that message. Uh, we're talking about human rights uh, for everybody, and this includes this particular group. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have so many follow-up questions, but we'll hold them for a minute. Uh, Mr. Farrell, can you share uh, your thoughts on this question about backsliding uh, and what your perspective is from ECRI? Uh, thank you very much, Mason. And I should, like everybody else, um, I thank very much the German presidency for organizing this very important meeting and they organized another one at the beginning of their presidency. Uh, and, uh, and to say that I think we, we should all be very pleased with what both the minister and the secretary general of the Council of Europe said in their opening statements, their firm commitment to protecting LGBT rights and, and strengthening the uh, protections for them. Uh, I should just say also that uh, I'm the vice chair of uh, ECRI, the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, which has been referred to a number of times because ECRI uh, monitors uh, the 
performance of all the 47 states of the Council of Europe uh, in relation to uh, racism and intolerance. And since shortly after the 2010 uh, recommendation, and because of that recommendation by the Committee of Ministers, ECRI then took on the responsibility also for LGBT rights. Uh, so since 2013, we have also, uh, in our country visits, we have looked at the position about LGBT people. Um, and we are now, uh, we are now, we have now set up a working group uh, to, to to draft a general policy recommendation on LGBTI rights, which we we didn't have this before. And the uh, while we have the uh, 2010 recommendation from the Council of Europe, which is a very important sort of foundation. Uh, document in this area. Uh, we also need something more detailed, uh, which for our uh, monitoring purposes, we can look at uh, when we go to a particular country and measure their performance against uh, that background. And we can also uh, have positive uh, recommendations that we can make to countries in our country reports. Uh, so we have just started on the process of that, and we have met a number of the people who are here already today, uh, including yourself, um, to talk about this and uh, about the needs uh, for uh, gender uh, recognition and so on. But I should also add that we have been talking about LGBTI. The original document, the original recommendation just talked about LGBT, because at that stage, people, I think, didn't see inter sex uh, people as a separate group with its, their own uh, particular difficulties and so on. But that has naturally come out of our looking at LGBT issues so that now we talk of LGBTI to include uh, uh, intersex people as well, uh, which you yourself are very well aware of. Um, having said all that, <laughs> all right, where does the backsliding come from? Well without going into a great deal of detail about it, I think that uh, the the recommendation from the Council of Europe was very important in its time because it was the first international intergovernmental statement uh, declaring protection for LGBT rights. Uh, and in the looking back at the initial annual reports of, of uh, ECRI at that time, we can see that it, each year it's saying for the first couple of years, it's saying that we are seeing progress in this area and we are seeing welcome uh, to, to, uh, changes being made in the various countries. And then we see a difference. Uh, there are many aspects to that. I suspect one of them is the uh, economic crisis, which was actually before the 2010 recommendation, but the results of which were probably only felt fully some years afterwards. I think perhaps there was also a feeling of um, disappointment uh, in a lot of the former Soviet countries uh, where they had looked forward to a completely new era and much better situation for everybody concerned. But after 15 or 20 years, it wasn't as good as that. And there was a lot of disillusion and unhappiness about that. And I think in that sort of situation, it is very easy to provide people with a scapegoat. Uh, it's much easier than to admit the real basis of the problems is to say that this is the fault of somebody. In the 1930s, the Nazis said it was the Jews. Uh, now it can be LGBT people, it can be immigrants and so on. So I think that that's probably the background. A big contribution to that has been hate speech. And the fact that we are now in, in, in our, now, society nowadays, we have this, on the one hand, wonderful development of, of the internet, but on the other hand, something that, that has great diff uh, problems about it as well, because it opens it up to all sorts of people uh, to post messages of hate. And I think that that is one of the things that we're going to have to fight hardest against in, in trying to change this tide of backsliding. Uh, 
uh, because this is then open to all sorts of people who are angry for all sorts of reasons uh, and gives them an opportunity or, or, or a scapegoat that they can look at and say, these people are different and they are the cause of our problems. Uh, how do you deal with that? It's not so easy because the uh, internet, the, the uh, European Union uh, it did uh, draw up a, a, a uh, arrangement with the larger internet companies back in 2016, and that has had some effect. But perhaps most of the, the worst uh, hate speech is coming from smaller platforms, uh, and we're going to have to deal with that and so find a way of dealing with that. Um, and that also indicates that we're going to have to work more closely with all sorts of people, including particularly the, country, the, the European Union, uh, in working in this area. So I leave that much <laughs> there at the moment, but I do think we have big problems. There are all sorts of background uh, reasons for them, but it is important to cut off the the uh, engine whereby uh, all sorts of, of, of untrue allegations are made and conspiracy theories are peddled. Uh, which are, are attractive to people who find the most simple solutions to, to their complex problems. Thank you. That's Thank you. that's helpful background and things to think about in our discussion today. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have our, our uh, member of parliament, Terry Renke. If you want to uh, address this as well, please. Thank you very much, Mason, and also from my side, thanks a lot to the organizers um, for setting this up. Um, I think a lot of uh, very, very valuable things have already been said by the previous speaker, so I will try to be short, um, and I think that we have the scene set then also deeper going into the, the different um, things that, that have been mentioned. But maybe just very briefly, when I look at the situation, why is this backsliding happening, and it's something I can only um, highlight again what Katrin has been saying with regards to the rise in hate speech, hate crime, uh, I mean also the rhetoric also here in the European Parliament have become much more aggressive from, from certain actors, uh, looking at the situations in countries like uh, Bia highlighting Hungary but also Poland, um, uh, I think that this is something that we very, very closely observe uh, and try to follow. Um, and I would say that um, there are two reasons that are also linked to each other in a way. And the one is, and this has been outlined by, uh, by the previous speakers, that we have a strengthening of authoritarian forces, that we have this authoritarian project that also doesn't only go as far as LGBTI rights, but that is basically a project that wants to destabilize the basis of democracies, of rule of law, independence of judiciary, and so on and so on. Um, and then it, it is linked to uh, attacking fundamental rights, also not only of LGBTI people, but also other minority groups, women's rights, as we see, um, for example, in Poland, these forces have become stronger over the past years. Um, and this means that there obviously is more readiness to then attack LGBTI people rhetorically. But also we see these very material, um, clear attacks on rights, like, for example, in Hungary, with the anti-trans legislation in other countries. Um, and I think that this is, um, this is something that is a very worrying trend, but I would like to add one observation that we make here in the European Parliament. The fact that this is now happening is not something that only started a couple of years ago. There has been a previous development where especially anti-LGBTI organizations have professionalized, they have become more radical, they have become more aggressive, and they basically set the scene and built the ground then for these authoritarian governments to put it into practice. And let me make one political uh, observation here as well. I think some previous speakers have mentioned this term gender ideology. I think what makes gender ideology so dangerous is not only that it is or it can be a sort of mobilizing uh, factor in election campaigns for a certain clientele of voters, but also it can serve as a glue or as a common ground for far right movements and right wing parts of conservative movements. And we have seen that this was used as a sort of common platform. And that is a development that I think is very, very worrying because obviously um, we would like to have strong democratic forces also in the conservative field that are standing up 
um, to these sort of, of hateful rhetorics and, and legislation. But then the second reason, um, and I think that it's important to also see this, we have these authoritarian forces, but on the other hand, we have also seen that over the past years, progressive forces maybe have not been outspoken enough answering to this, maybe have overlooked it. Maybe there were other things to do that were more important in quotation marks. And one of the very obvious examples for this on the European level is the Horizontal Equality Directive, where we have not seen enough push over the past years to get it over the line as EU legislation to really protect people from discrimination in all fields of society and on all grounds. Um, and as Katrin was also rightly saying, we have also seen in countries where maybe there are progressive governments in place that there is a certain stagnation when it comes to um, LGBTI rights. And this is something I think we have to see um, when we look at the reasoning of the backsliding. And lastly, is there no hope? Is everything bad and everything is just going to be turned away? I must admit that um, with this, starting with this analysis, um, I, I think that over the past years there has been a shift uh, in approach. And now we see with the first LGBTI equality strategy uh, from the European Commission, but also with certain governments inside of the European Union, but also um, in Europe as a whole, to be more outspoken about this, to really stand up to these developments um, and to also be ready to pay a certain level of political capital um, in order to um, defend fundamental rights, to defend rule of law and democracy. Uh, I actually think that we can turn this around and I uh, very much hope that this discussion, uh, these kinds of discussions can also be a ground for, um, you know, organizing and then seeing how we can strategically um, counter these, these attacks on LGBTI rights and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry. So I'd like to suggest um, that we do our best to actually have a dialogue on some, some questions together. That's not always easy using this online technology, but I know sometimes just hearing responses from individuals can get a little tiring after many hours. Um, and I think there are a lot of rich questions have been brought up. Um, I'd like to start just bringing things back to the 2010 SOGI recommendation. and especially with, with some of the backlash that's been discussed, this movement towards more authoritarian governments and challenges in general to democracy and rule of law. Like, how, what do you see as the potential impact of the 2010 SOGI recommendation give to address or help counter the climate of black backsliding that we're seeing today? Um, how, how is that being used and, and how can we use it better? And I'm wondering, Katrin or Bea, if either of you want to speak to that from a civil society perspective. I can start, but I think then Bea has much more direct on, on the ground um, experience. So just to say, I mean, we've been, been looking at both review processes together with our members, and I think there's really two points. One I already mentioned in my intervention, it's the systematic and regular evaluation of policies and legislation on national level in all member states. And I think it's really, really important too that there is an official mechanism that is looking at all the different areas. And, and Michael Farrell mentioned the attempts now to firmly include intersex rights, which we think is a really important step forward. And in that sense, really setting out what needs to be done on national level in the time between one and the other review process. But what we hear from member organizations is also that the review process at least gives them an opportunity in countries where the government is not open to speak with civil society, where the government is not engaging in, in regular consultations, to actually go to their governments and knock on the door and say, this, this official review process is coming up. What, what are your answers? Where, where are you standing? Can we discuss together? So it's, it's offering an, uh, an opportunity for civil society to engage with governments, um, also in those countries where governments are not necessarily um, open for this consultation. So these are just two main points. And then, Bea, I'm sure you have a lot to add on that. Uh, thank you. I can, I, I think, all reinforce what you have just said, Catherine, that these uh, international standards are a statement by an international community that we can use as a measure, that, that we can always uh, re regularly evaluate and, and, and really come up and, and put it into the face of, of the government uh, uh, um, actors to 
uh, to remind them of European norms and and to um, um, and to um, perhaps at, at at least to some extent discourage them from from the deprivation of existing rights. I'm curious, Bea, if you want to speak t t at all to how it might be able to help as you're seeing backlash like you've seen in Hungary. Um, where would you like more support or where could uh, instruments like the recommendation be be more useful? Is there anything you'd like to, to share as you're dealing with this on the ground? So the, the very uh, mechanism of, of reviewing the uh, the standards set in the recommendations is, is I think, really important. And, and it's not, not only from internally, like uh, uh, LGBTI uh, um, civil society organizations uh, trying to step up and, and evaluate the, the actual realization of, of those recommendations, but it's, uh, it's, it's really important to uh, get uh, some external um, uh, pressure and, and some external um, um, discourse on on, uh, on on how the how governments are responsible for 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 coming up to this measure of of uh, of a European institution. Thanks. Thanks. And Michael, obviously, ECRI has an important role in all of this. I'm curious. Briefly, from your perspective, how can we uh, encourage and push the implementation of uh, strategic policy measures that actually put more of the recommendation into practice? And how do we make sure that impacts the most marginalized of our communities? Can you speak to that briefly? Yes, sir. Um, well, I think the problem is, of course, that you can report on what is happening in these countries, but if the government doesn't care, uh, then that doesn't uh, have much effect. So, and I think we can divide countries into two blocks. There are the countries that are three countries who are doing well, the countries that are not doing very well because they originally agreed to change the laws and they have lost interest in doing so, or they're they're back <coughs> backing down a little because of right wing pressure, and then the countries that are simply ignoring what is happening, and we know what they are: Turkey, Russia. Uh, Poland increasingly, Hungary increasingly, and but there, that doesn't mean that we are without any power because the European Court of Human Rights, first of all, all the countries in the Council of Europe have to sign up to the Convention on Human Rights. And the European Court interprets that and also determines whether uh, actions taken uh, are in breach of it. And the European Court has, has increasingly uh, made findings against uh, various governments on this, uh, and that has some effect. There may be some governments that are far worse than that, but in addition to that, you have the the countries which are members of the the European Union, and it is perhaps more alarming that there are countries that are members of the European Union which are now blatantly uh, breaking. The, the rules on LGBT uh, issues. But on the other hand, the strength there is that the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union is binding. And increasingly, there is a conflict coming up between a number of the countries and the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union, which does have power to uh, find con countries. And eventually, there may be some major political uh, row between the countries if they continue to to uh, defy the law. So I think it, it's, it's necessary to use the methods that we have been using of recommendation and so on. They will work with some governments. They also are very important to tell people what the issues are. And, you know, there is perhaps more uh, trust put in, in recommendations and reports that come from semi-official bodies than from the, the uh, NGO community, not that I am criticizing the NGO community at all, and I come from that community originally. Um, but I think that there is a necess necessity for concerted effort by all the agencies in both the Council of Europe and the European Union 
uh, that work in the human rights area, and we have lots of them. We have the, the human rights uh, commissioner in the Council of Europe as well, but that must be coordinated in order to put pressure on the various governments that are, are at the moment uh, blatantly breaking the rules here to try and put some pressure on them and also to give some encouragement to the LGBTI communities in these countries which are suffering and which are in danger of being demoralized if they don't find that there is enough uh, support coming from outside. So, thank you. I'm wondering in that context, what does it mean that the COE presidency will be changing um, and with the um, new leadership for Hungary uh, suggesting a focus on the role of family in modern society and the influence of Christian values on European historic and cultural landscape, what is that going to mean for Europe um, and the Council of Europe's role? Um, and how can we prevent human rights from being uh, used to marginalized, already marginalized groups? Um, Mr. Schokenbrook, I hope you don't mind me putting you on the spot with that question, but I'm curious if you have thoughts on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, no, no need to apologize. I mean, I'll, I'll, of course, I will not comment on individual country positions or country situations. That is a bit complicated, but the fundamental question that you raised um, uh, is, of course, a very pertinent one. Um, we have, I mean, first short on, on the traditional values uh, um, uh, side of things. In particular, a reference has been made to Christian values and so on. I, I think the, the fact that we are today celebrating 72 years of progress in Europe when it comes to protecting and progressing, advancing with the human rights agenda. Um, uh, Europe is a predominantly Christian continent. That is the predominant uh, uh, religion, the faith. And, and, and um, so I don't see any fundamental contradiction between uh, progressing with human rights for everyone uh, and uh, having Christian values uh, uh, permeating society of people. Either. There is no contradiction whatsoever on, on that. I think history uh, has borne, borne that out. So uh, that, that on that point. But there is, of course, uh, uh, an issue uh, there that we should indeed be vigilant uh, against these, uh, these erosions that I, I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, I think what is necessary is, uh, and the steps have been set, but they need to be pursued. We need to be a bit more combative when it comes to uh, uh, protecting uh, democracy. Maybe uh, many governments and individuals uh, have taken this too much for granted for the last decades, uh, that as if this was an irreversible uh, progressive process that would uh, continue uh, by itself. And no, human rights, democracy rule are very fragile little plants. Uh, I think that's a metaphor that Vaclav Havel once used, they need to be watered and, and fed and nurtured uh, in order to, to thrive and to live. Um, that is maybe what we should uh, maybe should inform the actions in the coming years. In, I know in German there is a very um, uh, important concept that I learned when I was a, a constitutional uh, law student, and that is the concept of streitbare Demokratie, meaning the combative democracy. Um, and, and that is something that, of course, very much linked to Germany's history in the last uh, century, that you, these things can be eroded from within and that you need to be, have your bulwark and your forces to defend, to defend yourself. Um, one element I can mention, and you asked Mason earlier how we can use the 2010 recommendation. When we drafted that recommendation, and I, like Bea, was around at that time, um, we uh, saw this as, as a standard of achievement uh, to make sure that we would <laughs> pull slowly all 47 countries of the Council of Europe in that direction. Today, we have discovered that there is also a second function and that it is a, a reference for us to, to measure, to make sure that countries do not uh, regress and, and to, to keep uh, at least in some situation, maybe not, not ensure immediate progress, but uh, avoid immediate regression. Um, I think that is a very additional important role. And I think there, our work in an intergovernmental committee as supplementary to the important work of ECRI, of the court, it is very important that governments can hold each other to account uh, as democratic uh, 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 countries in, in a single committee. So that review process is important. 
And what is also very important is our work uh, on hate speech, which Michael Farrell has mentioned as, a, as, a, as the main vehicle for all these backsliding tendencies that we mentioned. Um, hate speech is something which, of course, is, uh, covers LGBTI phobia, but it's much broader than that. Um, there is the, all sorts of racist uh, hate speech. And uh, the, the new steering committee is working with the media committee in the council on a new standard for Europe to help governments to strike the right balance and to be also there maybe a bit less respectful of the sacrosanct principle of freedom of expression, which is crucial, but it is not absolute. And, and there are other human rights to be protected too. And I think we will find in a few years' time that we'll have a good standard to strike the right balance and to be more effective in, in fighting such expressions of hatred. Any other thoughts on that from panelists? Can I, can I maybe just make one comment? Because, you know, again and again, I feel that there is uh, this code now that is being used talking about, for example, strengthening the role of the family, which I think nobody that I have ever worked with in the LGBTI movement and feminist movements or anywhere else has any problem with. The problem is that this has become a code, and I think we have to call a spade a spade, for strengthening the role of white heterosexual families and basically discriminating against all kinds of families, including my own family, that looks different from this. And I think that that is where um, we, we have to be very clear about, you know, we want to have uh, strong family policies. We want to have societies where people can live how they want to live, also including forming families. But this cannot mean that you have uh, head on discriminatory um, approach to what a family can look like. And I think that this is also what we have been trying with different rainbow organizations over the past years to establish that this diversity of what a family can be has to be, if we want to be in line with human rights obligations, if we want to be in line with our, the foundations of our societies, that's what we have to acknowledge and that's what we have to accept. And that has to be the basis of our discourse on family. Can I can I add something as well? Sorry, it's a bit difficult uh, virtually how to kind of. Um, no, I just wanted to to add, and I think um, very much from um, what Jeroen was saying is like indeed, I think the instruments are there, and I was trying to to mention that in my intervention. I think the the recommendations are European standards that have been set, yes, as goals we're all wanting to work towards, but by now also as, you know, the bars of, of European standards that need to be achieved and that we all hold member states accountable. I think similar on European Union level, there are very clear um, obligations, both in the treaties and the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And again, I alluded to that very quickly, for example, in the regulations around EU funding and, and especially the, the new round of the structural funds, the principle of non-discrimination and actually full respect of fundamental rights is very clearly in there. And no matter what we understand by family, that the discri discrimination against certain kinds of families over other is not in line with these principles um, is very clear. And I think that's where you know, we see a, a, an increased role for Council of Europe bodies, um, European Union institutions, I think spe specifically the European Commission, the European Council being a, playing a critical role, but also other member states of supporting these in institutions to hold up the standards and hold member states accountable, even if it becomes um, a bit less pleasant than I think we were used to work together um, in, in, in the years before. Did I see yourself wanting to intervene? Yes, I I just wanted to add to to the importance of of, of revealing uh, when when human rights are used uh, and and manipulated to marginalize groups and and to reveal when uh, how important it is to reveal when concepts like the family or the nation or a community are used to to promote exclusion and and the deprivation of rights and perhaps. Uh, uh, um, a method to um, to reveal these, and that I, I, I definitely think that it's it's really important to to always point at this when when communicating, 
uh, but perhaps research into people's attitudes to the role of law, to uh, institution uh, might help to, to reveal when the government speech uh, even contradicts existing social attitudes and to reveal this as, as, as propaganda, as uh, all, all research, uh, both planned research in Hungary and existing research in Poland shows. Carrie, I'd like to go back to something you said earlier, if I may, um, before we close out. And one was the raising awareness of this kind of anti-gender movement or movements that we're seeing throughout the region. Um, and certainly when it comes to a lot of the um, attacks against trans people and trans rights, a lot of this tends to be in this argument that somehow um, rights for trans people or LGBT people somehow will be bad for non-trans women, um, the, which is very different than I learned about, which is that we are all in this together. Um, but I'm curious if you can speak a little bit more about how we make sense of this growing movement to position LGBT rights as something somehow in conflict with women's rights. And, and what do we need at this moment to move forward? Uh, thanks for raise, uh, raising this point, Mason. Um, I actually think that one, I would say, of the most crucial documents that the Council of Europe has come up with uh, plays a very important role there. Also to become aware in the analysis of how basically these, these narratives and rhetorics that you were referring to uh, are being used to divide uh, uh, progressive movements, to uh, uh, divide fundamental rights movements like the women's rights movement and the uh, LGBTI movement. And obviously I'm speaking about the Istanbul Convention because I think that we can very clearly see um, how uh, basically there is a right-wing attack on LGBTI rights um, and then this also very strongly negatively affect women's rights um, and it's, it goes hand in hand. So basically the, the vision of a society that comes after that, um, why the Istanbul Convention is being attacked, why rule of law, why democratic standards are being attacked, are obviously one where sexual minorities like the LGBTI community are sidelined, marginalized, excluded. But it's also a vision where women don't have self-determination anymore, where women don't have the freedom that they probably have today. So I think it is ultimately important um, to unite these struggles. Um, and I think in the past, when we have been successful, it was also due to the fact that uh, in most cases we were actually going together and we were fighting in queer feminist unison. Um, and I think that when it comes to now defending the Istanbul Convention, but also when it comes to a lot of other issues, um, I think that this is going to be absolutely crucial, that we have all these progressive fundamental rights movements um, together. And I would say that this will be the crucial question that we have to answer. Like in this backsliding, we are analyzing it, we are seeing it. I think we are now at a point where we have a pretty clear picture of what we are up against. Will we be able on our side to bring together people to stand up to this? And I'm obviously talking about uh, movements, I'm talking about civil society organizations, but I'm also talking about progressive political forces, governments, um, and I think they are the Council of Europe, also the European Union, will play an absolutely crucial part to bring together these actors and then actually formulate a response that says we are not going to give up and we are going to stand up to this backlash and we want to further promote and expand rights and not um, uh, slide back on this. Yeah, I am um, was really impressed by a recent statement by Commissioner Dali uh, coming out in support of LGBT rights and affirming, I think the quote was, trans rights are not a threat to feminism in any way, and in fact go hand in hand in the international human rights framework. Having those kinds of statements publicly are incredibly helpful for civil society um, and other actors. Um, and Joan, not to put you on the spot again, but I'm curious if there's some a way that we could see perhaps a, a similar statement um, from the Secretary General at some point. Uh, I was very impressed by her statements earlier today. And having that out there, I think it is quite useful. Um, so I'm just wondering, if may, may as we close, if you see opportunities uh, for uh, more engagement on this issue and uh, see how we can get people, uh, especially in these important roles, uh, showing that we're stronger together. Thank you, Thank you Mason. 
Um, you know, again, you're still not putting me on the spot. I can reassure you. And uh, the, um, I think we, we we heard some pretty clear language from the Secretary General earlier in in our meeting. And um, I, I can't give you immediate uh, quote for her now, but I can give you one of mine, if you like, uh, on behalf of the Council of Europe. And that is that human rights are not a zero-sum game. That is, giving rights to some group of people doesn't mean that the rights of other groups are diminished or have to be reduced. That's not the way human rights function. They are universal, interdependent, and indivisible. Um, and I think that is a clear principle of the Universal Declaration. It's a clear principle of the European Convention on Human Rights. And I think it's a message that we should carry with force. I, I was very impressed by, Terry, what you said about the need for solidarity. There cannot be, I mean, human rights movements, by definition, cannot be, should not be selfish, because uh, your rights are my rights and, and the other way around. Um, so I think th this is very important. And I, I like your suggestion of, of maybe uh, federating much more strongly and more concretely these different uh, movements, that we need to make sure that there is a common message there. Uh, I can tell you within the Secretariat, we are in very close touch in my directorate with another directorate um, that is dealing with gender equality and, and precisely the Istanbul Convention. We, we discuss all these matters uh, very frequently and we are uh, as concerned as, as you are. So I think there are some ideas there and the main point is, uh, is solidarity. Uh, human rights are for everybody or they are for nobody. And with that, we close today's first panel. Thank you all for your contributions and look forward to uh, continuing this dialogue together. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye, your own. Thank you, Mason, Bye. 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 and all the panelists for this great. Uh, inspiring panel and very uh, with very strong words so the rise of anti-lgbti hate rhetoric puts democracy at risk i just have some um unite the struggle the struggles human rights are universal and indivisible and um hold member states accountable but just uh, some quick words because we mason later on will have the opportunity to talk about it and you can give then uh in the conclusion round uh, a summary and we will take it up but after the next panel. So thank you for now, Mason. Thank you very much. And now we are coming, dear audience, we are coming to a short break. Um, it will go until 3.45. Then the second panel will start. It's about, the, um, the second panel is how can strategic goals be achieved on a national level? It's uh, specifically about how can we hold member states accountable? And I'm happy to see you back, to welcome you back at 3.45. Enjoy your break. Thank you. <laughs>